All right, so um, last week before I was rudely interrupted for my idea of how we should start the episode, uh, my idea was that we did a little role play to uh, usher in this new episode of Stacked. What episode is this? I think this is nine. Yeah. This is nine? Episode nine? Nine? Okay. So to usher in Stacked episode nine. So... I think let's do a little a role play of uh, Family Guy characters gathering around the couch to listen to an episode of Stax. So I'm going to be Peter Griffin. Uh, Chris, you're going to be Stewie. And Brandon, you're going to be Lois, okay? Um, okay, okay. <clears throat> let's, let's, let's do this like it's we're the writers of an episode of Family Guy. So intro, um, the Griffin household. Cue, cue the music. <laughs> Alright family, we got a great we got a great evening ahead of us, and it's time to listen to some some stacked with the boys Ethan, Brandon, and Chris. What do we what do we say, huh? Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I can't fucking do. It. Lois, what about you, huh? Hey Peter, you want to come listen to some stacked with me? <laughs> come on, Lois, come come pop a squat. All right, the honey. Oh, yeah. Why are we listening to this garbage? Stewie, you're gonna sit on the couch right now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna squeeze your little football head. Yep, I just squeeze it two times. I'm gonna pick you up by the ears and put you on the couch. We're gonna, we're gonna listen to some stacked, all right? Listen here, fat man. If you don't let me go, I'm gonna vaporize you. <laughs> what so is bad. this episode? <laughs> That's Marge. What are you doing? All okay, right, this is all right. We gotta do. You gotta next. You know what? Next episode, we gotta do Simpsons. That's something I can do. I can do that. Uh. <laughs> Why do you have to do Family Guy? You're the only one who can do impressions here. <laughs> Come on, it's Dark it's it's oh, all right. Yeah. Mm. All right, let's all be Yoda to introduce Stacked. Mm. Welcome to episode nine of Stacked. <laughs> oh, he's going to do the whole episode like with this. <laughs> Yoda and Yoda. <laughs> all right. That's enough of that. Yeah, welcome back to Stacked episode nine. Uh, here we are. Ethan, Brand, Chris, and uh, we got we got we got a good show for you, I guess. I don't know. I don't care anymore. What do you guys think? How are you doing? What's up? Who are you? What are you doing here, Brandon? Who are you? I'm Brandon. <laughs> Chris, how are you? Uh, I'm Chris. <laughs> We're doing. I'm doing okay. Thanks for asking. All right. Crazy shit happening on the news. If you're not watching. Oh yeah. Yeah, you should really be paying attention. We got, we got baby presidents. We got boss baby presidents with papers. Mm. We got we got explosions in Beirut. Yeah. Did you guys see that? That shit was. Yeah, more that was insane. It's gonna be a bit dated, uh, since. since yeah, a week. Out, but like, fuck. Hope hope everyone down there's okay. Cause that shit looked like stuff out of a movie. Yeah, it looked like Children of Men, but in real life, and I was scared. For those people. Yeah. Hey, spoilers. <laughs> spoilers for Beirut, yeah. <laughs> spoilers for Beirut? <laughs> Jesus Christ. No, it's not we not a joking matter. Lots of people got hurt in that explosion. Uh yeah, any any uh, any other personal updates you guys want to talk about this that happened to you this week before we get into it? I got um, criterions. Oh yeah? You took advantage the last of that, that day sale? before the Sale ended. Yeah, I, I bought Ace in the Hole by Billy Wilder and In a Lonely Place by Nicholas Ray, two great classic Hollywood movies that mm. if you guys haven't seen, you definitely need to check out. Yeah, definitely mm. check it out, guys. I haven't seen. Either. They're good noirs, which is mm. rare. So, yeah, yeah, freaking sweet. Uh, I got I got a report on something very special that happened to me in my life this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Chris Chris was here for this. Uh, we went on an odyssey to pick up a grand treasure, if you will. Uh, on Saturday, yeah, Saturday, uh, Chris and my two roommates, we uh, we went down to Tustin. We rented a U-Haul, and uh, we went up to Corona to pick up a very special purchase of mine that I've been saving up for all summer. And it's a, uh, a seven-foot life-size replica of Jar Jar Binks. And it was quite an adventure to say the least, wouldn't you say, Chris? Like, yeah, it 
it was just like the most bizarre day like but it also felt like an adventure like we were the goonies or something yeah, we yeah. so <laughs> we were this is the last summer before i can get a jar jar big statue <laughs> <laughs> no but we started out our adventure grabbing the u-haul i had to rent a u-haul because nobody's car is big enough to fit this giant fucking gungan so i went and rented a trailer we went down to the u-haul place and we were confronted by a cowboy who hitched us up our trailer. Do you remember that? We yeah. were listening to cowboy music. And it just so happened that we were lo- we pulled in into the U-Haul place. And as the cowboy music kicked in, a this dude with this giant cowboy hat started like walking slowly towards our car. Like perfectly synced to the music. And we are like, oh my god. But yeah, he fixed us up with the trailer. Uh... Then we went down and we picked up my sweet Jar Jar Binks. He, uh, he was wrapped up in like saran wrap and newspaper like a fucking sarf- sarcophagus. The dude is like, uh, this isn't for the females, is it? Because they don't like this sort of stuff. <laughs> and we're like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. So I, so I said, no, sir, this is, this is going to be a chick magnet. And uh, so far, it's been getting good results. That's all I'll say. Yeah. The first <laughs> night you... Um... You had Jar Jar at yours. Uh, Jules, Jules came over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, Tori, wa- Tori desperately wanted to see it when she got back to town. Yep. And then uh, lots of other people came through. Like it was like I I hosted a viewing, you know, like a funeral <laughs> because it's because of all this COVID stuff. We didn't really let them stay in our house. They sort of just like they sort of just walked through the front door, looked at it, and walked through the side door. You know, like mm-hmm. <laughs> and a bunch of people came over and just wow, looked at it like look that. Look at it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the most expensive thing I've ever bought in my life. Uh, here, I'm going to, I'm looking at him right now as we speak. He's holding a Bernie, a Bernie Sanders sign. He's got a bunch of pictures. Yep. I'll throw up some pictures right there. He's got some balloons on him. He's got a trans scarf because Jar Jar Binks does say trans rights, everyone. That should be obvious. Come on. But yeah, now I have that in my life and I don't know how i'm gonna take him when i move out of this house but that's a problem for another time all right that's all oh, i'll say yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. so yeah that was the that was the big adventure for this week for me and chris um and we had a good time and we had a good time putting together our stacks for today's episode which is directorial debuts now let's get let's break down how the show works shall we once a week, we set a topic or theme and go our separate ways to construct our own three-film stack. Then after a week, we come back here on the podcast and share our own stacks one film at a time. Then at the end of the show, we will mix and match our nine films to make the ultimate decision on what quintessential three-film stack we are checking out of this hypothetical video store. Yeah, we're doing directorial, debu- directorial debuts. <laughs> Slip of the tongue there. Pee Wee Herman. Ha <laughs> Directorial debuts. Yeah, Pee Wee Herman. Directorial debuts. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. Brandon went first after Joey huh? last episode. I well, did te- not. Technically, you had a... Yes, you did because yeah, you had a double I stack. And I that's how go. the order went. Semantics. You did go. You talked you did, about, you talked about Cabin in the Woods, did you? I after did. Joey, did you not? Okay. Because uh-huh. then it went... You, uh, it went Joey, you, me, Chris. So now it's back to me again. So let me just break down how I constructed this stack. So there's a lot of great first features from directors, right? No. Um, so what I wanted to do with this stack was, um, do find directors where their first feature is bar none still my favorite feature of their entire filmography. Like I think I like I think they haven't gotten better than that. So that's that's all I'll say for this. I accidentally um, did that. I ordered it in chronological. I accidentally you did that. Did that. <laughs> yeah. Oh really? Well, that's good. That's that'll be a good theme. Chris, did you do that? Do you know by chance? <laughs> <laughs> It's okay if you didn't. I don't care. Yes, I did. Hey. 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 I did. <laughs> Bada bing. There we go. Oh yeah. Okay. So let me start out with my first. Uh, I, I just did this in chronological order. I can't really, I couldn't really think of an order to do this, 
So we'll we'll figure that out at the end, I guess. But uh, my first film is um, a 1994 film. Uh, it's an indie darling. It's one of the films that I think really started the modern indie movement because it was a it was a Sundance darling. It um it really like made the sort of super low budget film sort of a big thing during the time. It was that in Pulp Fiction. And my movie is 1994's Kevin Smith's Clerks. Now, um, Kevin Smith, I'll, I'll, I like to go into a little background into these first features, you know, just to give some context. Uh, so, Kevin Smith was inspired by director Richard Linklater in his film Slacker. Have you seen that, Brandon? Slacker? No, but I want okay. to. <laughs> but he was in, that was the film for him that really told him, like, to get off his ass and start making movies. And it really set the tone for what kind of movies he wanted to make and like like the types of settings he wanted to do in his hometown and like base it off people he knew. Um, so once Kevin Smith got the inspiration, he actually went, this is crazy, I didn't know this. He went to Vancouver, the like Vancouver Film School. School, Jesus, school. I am all over the place today. Uh, he went. He attended the Vancouver Film School and he dropped out four months in. Because he said he felt like he learned enough. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. They're both on their phones. They're not paying attention to my rambles. That's okay. No, I heard you. <laughs> You're both looking at your phones. I don't care. I, and then know he moved why? back to New Jersey and he worked at a convenience store, which is where he came up with the idea for Clerks. Now, I'm very on and off with Kevin Smith's direction, but I think Clerks proves that, like, what he's like it takes everything that he's best at because it's a really tiny budget like it's a black it, he uses black and white because he didn't have um a budget for lighting and it's just characters talking that's basically what this movie is it's two two convenience store clerks and they just shoot the shit for the whole time there's drop there's like drama in their lives that they dish out about um there's some really funny shenanigans that they get into like uh when he orders like all those like one of the clerks also works at the video store right next to the the convenience store and he's like he just his goal i guess is just to piss every customer off as much as he can because he does he cares that little about his jobs so he there's like a point where like he spits in a guy's face who's trying to buy something at the convenience store and he's like a mom and a baby like walk into the video store and they want to they want to order a movie and he pretends to like talk to like a pornography studio and he orders like a shitload of these dirty films and stuff like that and i don't know it just it reminds me of a time uh, a time in youth where you're working these uh shitty jobs and you just like there's bigger things that will happen in your life and there's uh more important things to think about than these jobs and i saw this at my local independent theater the the tower in salt lake city with a a group of fans at midnight and it's honestly one of my favorite films ever just from that experience alone it's just it's such a great film brandon you hate this film so dish it out don't like this movie <laughs> why don't you like this movie i don't think it's funny i don't think the characters are that great and well developed like they're stuck in place which is nice because like i love stories where people are kind of like growing up as adults like brixby bear we talked about episodes ago you know but this movie for me is like just so dull. Like the the cinematography, the actions that actually take place by the characters, and like it's not memorable at all. Like he doesn't he have sex with somebody who's like dead or some shit. <laughs> yeah, she does. I didn't. Uh, I didn't find that funny at all. And I, I, I don't know. It just didn't connect with me at all as a story or anything. That's so because the two main characters remind me of me and you. So I find that you don't find it relatable at all. I well I I do I feel like well I do agree with that I just don't I don't know if I like love the movie because of that listen son did you watch it on your laptop no that doesn't matter I I think I did but I don't think it matters for clerks well that's weird because this is hailed as like one of his best but it's just not your cup of tea I guess I love dogma that that dogma amazing I, I I think dogma's good I do think it's good but. I, there's just sometimes when Smith is given a big budget, um, a bigger budget, I should, I should say, because he's never really had a really big budget. But I, see, I sometimes feel like he gets lost in that budget sometimes, and he tries to go for like these uh, 
these gags and stuff that don't really work out or like these types of characters. And I feel like his what he's best at is his scripts. So this film where it's like it's void of any sort of production value or anything. It's just focused on the characters and them talking is just something I find completely fascinating. Uh, Chris, what do you think of this film? Oh, I haven't actually, seen it, have you? I haven't seen Clerks. That's a thing. Okay. That's right. Uh, hmm. <laughs> have you seen any Kevin Smith movie? Maybe. Uh, can you name some? Because uh, uh, the, the name sounds familiar. Tusk. Clerks. Mallrats. Oh, I've seen, I've seen Tusk. Tusk. Okay. Is that that's good? A, I mean, like, I don't, in, in comparison, in comparison to no, his other films, that's, I know. That's like, one of my least favorite. Of I think it's okay. better than Clerks. But I what? Yeah. Oh. I think Tusk no. is like middle of the road, but like it has oh tonal God. flaws, really it's, bad tonal flaws. It's nothing like Clerks, though. You can agree, like. Oh yeah, the absolutely like bare bones minimum. That's that's what I'm really saying about him getting lost in a budget. Like I think he took this really cool idea of like a metamorphosis of a guy turning into a walrus, a walrus. <laughs> but I think he's he's like it lacks any focus, which I think the focus that Clerks has and that has been missed in a lot of his films afterwards, which is why it's my first pick for the best directorial debuts. Okay, Chris, take us into your first film, shall we? All right. So my first film, um, we've all seen. Ethan, the first time you saw it, I was actually with you. It was during our interterm class that somehow keeps getting talked about in this freaking um, Uh podcast. It's a 2014 film directed by Jennifer Kent. It is The Babadook. Oh, wow. What were you, wait, what did you think I was going to say? I thought you were going to say The Witch. Oh, eh, it's good. It's just, I'm, I was more impressed with Babadook. Right. Um, okay, so basically, how do I put this? Babadook is about a single mother who, um, after the death of her husband, is forced to uh, begin uh, independently caring for her young and very irritable child but um at the same time she's also being haunted by this like ghostly presence um but it's like the larger part of it is that it's like a manifestation of grief you know as this monster um but yeah so i was very impressed with jennifer ken's direction in this film because it's all if i had to describe this movie with one word it's the word eerie it's just very unsettling like every like dark corner in a room if it's not lit with any kind of light it's just the most terrifying thing within the context of this movie and at least for me after i've watched it i went home that night and could and like i think i slept with like a night light for the first time in a while wow. but like yeah, yeah like this movie like really creeps me out i mean like it it really like does is a testament to like how in order to execute a good, quote unquote, good scare, you don't necessarily need monsters on screen. You don't necessarily need all this blood, although obviously that could be helpful. Um, but it's the way you execute, th- like putting the audience into the mind of this terrified woman, that real terror really starts to arise. And um, yeah, I was just really impressed like how she's able to do that without very much, if any, experience in the director's chair. And like, I really found, uh, I think her name is Essie Davis, the lead actress. Her performance is, in all honesty, probably one of, one of, if not my favorite performance by a lead actress in a horror film. I really think she did a great job. Um, of course, there are some issues with the film. The editing, especially in the beginning, is pretty rough. And the script is like a... It's a little twisty at times, I guess. But I think where this movie shines is the execution of this character. And yeah, really, really good. Um, Brandon, what what do you think about this movie? Uh, I really like it. Uh, I just saw The Babadook for the first time. I think it was like two or three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. You don't have to fact check that. But uh, <laughs> Hold on a second. Oh, hold on. Oh, oh, shit. Right. oh whoa. Don't have to fact check it. What are you, oh, Trump? <laughs> Uh, it's a good movie. I I love the uh, the actors in it. I think they all do a great job, especially the kid. Like, they're often in movies. I find it difficult to have like a great kid performance, and that kid in that movie just plays disturbed really well. You know, uh, I think it's a great like treatise on um, grief, like you said. Uh, I love the cinematography in that movie, 
And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a big influence for Ari Aster. Because I was just thinking that like grief as like a key theme. I, I can totally see that. Yeah, Essie Davis reminds me a lot of Tony Colette in Hereditary, as well as what you were saying about utilizing a dark space in a room to mm -hmm. its fullest potential during a scene to like scare the audience as well as like indicate like a source of emptiness in that person's life. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's great. Um like you said, I, I have really big issues. Like you took away uh like the editing in the first 30 minutes of the movie is like rapid cut. Like it's like every scene seems like it's like 30 seconds to a minute long. Yeah. It's and like I, a Casey Neistat video or something. <laughs> right. And I, and I don't know if it's like supposed to be that way, but it was really, it, I don't know, it didn't really sit right with me. And I don't know if that was supposed to contribute to the atmosphere, but it didn't really work with me. Right. I, I really like the editing in this film just because, like, I think it does support its themes of a parent coming to terms with, like, their ableism, I guess, with their child and uh, mm -hmm. her inexperience about, like, handling this sort of situation while at the same time dealing with the grief of her husband, you know, the grief and guilt, while also, also like, not knowing uh, how to respectfully take care of her child and... It's that's what really spawns off all of this. <laughs> oh my fucking! Brandon, God. when you can, we, uh, I need to address this. When you yawn, can you stop flailing your tongue around like you're a fucking like? <laughs> I was the Babadook. You oh, you were the In Babadook. That one frame okay. of that movie, you know. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> no, but. Yeah, Jennifer Kent. That's the director's name, right? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that like the 2010s have spawned like such a awesome wave of horror directors? Like you got her, you got um Aster, you got Aster, Egger. Egger. Um yeah, those those three and I think hers is my like, favorite of their like debut features. Yeah. I think yeah. I'd, yeah, no. I'd probably say it. Yeah. You like hereditary more? Yeah, or I, like, which... I like Midsummer and Hereditary more than. Well, Midsummer is not his debut. Oh, I'm just oh about you mean debuts? debuts? I like yeah. it better than The Witch. Yeah, mm, yeah, same. and I think I like it a smidge more than Hereditary, but yeah. the Babadook is just like, yes, Chris, we saw this together, and like, I've never been so like stressed out in a movie. <laughs> I've never been so like, uh. What what do you call it? Like like anxious? No, I not guess. anxious. Just like uh, on the edge of your seat, on pins and needles. I don't know. Shitting your pants. Vi what what's the word for being violently unaware of what's going on? You know, confused. Like, the not confused. <laughs> Donald not Trump. confused. Like Donald. I Trump. felt like I felt like a deer in headlights in most scenes in that film, just because it's so like when the Babadook is like there. You know, it's so like. Ah, so noisy, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I get but, that. Like you're, you're almost like paralyzed in yes. your seat. I, paralyzed with fear. Like I think that's the most paralyzed I've ever been because it's so, it's so violently scary at some time, at some points. You know, not yeah. like overwhelming. It's not graphic or anything. It's just like the filmmaking disabled. Gets to your, gets to your core. You know. Yeah. It's that's a great, great first pick. Like, I'm glad that we have one of those one of those directors where she's only done one other film, but like this film like shows promise, man, you know, mm. I'm, I'm super excited to see what any of these uh, like 2010s horror directors got for us in the future. I'm excited. Yes. The Babadook first pick. Awesome. All right. Woo. Brandon. 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 Film. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's one by my one of my favorite directors, uh, Sidney Lumet. It's Twelve Angry Men. I knew this one. I knew yeah. this one was Wait, coming. That's a well, that's one of his that's his first film. That, that's, that's his, his first, first film. movie. Oh, shit. Okay. He knocked it out of the park with that one. It yeah. it's like not only is this my second favorite movie ever made, yeah. this is also the only other perfect movie. Like I don't really think movies generally can be like perfect. But 12 Angry Men and Back to the Future are the two where I'm like, no, they're definitely like just masterfully crafted. Like if you show anybody who doesn't like black and white movies, movies in the 50s or 60s, 
uh, a classic movie, it needs to be 12 Angry Men because it, it still lives up today. Like the pacing of this movie is incredible. The themes of this movie are incredible. The performances, especially Henry Fonda. And I think it's, who, who, I think it's, uh, what's it? The guy, Cobb? No, I don't remember. The guy who plays, I think it's Cobb, Jack Cobb or something. Ty Cobb? No, not Ty Cobb. That's a baseball player. Anyway, uh, excellent in this movie. And like the way it, it maneuvers through its like plot, you immediately want to rewatch it after you finish it. And that's how good it is. Is it lives up to today. It's got a like an isolated setting, but it's all the more enrapturing just because of it. It's so crazy like adapting a play into a film, you know? Cuz with a play you only have uh visually speaking you'll sometimes you only have so much to go off of you know right. in this case you have one fucking room right that's where the entire film is taking place is just this one room where the jurors have to debate it out on whether this this young boy is innocent or innocent or not and it's on it's it's a mesmerizing film like I'm I'm not going to be contrary in Ethan with Back to the Future on this one, Brandon. This is a this is a masterpiece of a film. Um, Henry Fonda. I think this was my first. No, no, I saw Once Upon a Time in the West before this, but this is my first time of seeing him as like a good guy, which is what he's usually new, known for. Mm-hmm. And man, I I would follow Henry uh, Fonda into the fucking gates of hell. <laughs> this character <laughs> with juror 12 isn't he juror 12 i think he's like seven eight something like that because juror 12 eight, is like right. the skeezy businessman you're getting right. the criterion tomorrow actually Ooh, i got nice. an upgrade nice so but yeah it's a lot it's a movie about uh checking your prejudices you know um it's about com- like strangers coming together over uh certain issues you know it's having not know like much like barely anything about any of these jurors Mm -hmm. does like it it takes all the themes to a more grander scale you know because these these could be any americans you know Mm -hmm. and or not just any Amer. these could be anyone you know and it's just the writing is phenomenal like if you want to have a film take place in one room, you got to have it like be engaging as hell. And this is engaging as hell, to, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, love this movie. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I really, really like this movie too. I remember um, I went um, over to Brandon's place um, when I think maybe like the end of freshman year or something like that yeah. um, for a spring break or something like that. And it was the first time I saw this movie. And like when I when he put it on, and I was like, okay, like we're in this room, like what's gonna happen next? I had no idea what this movie was about. So and then like, but then like before I knew it, we were like forty five minutes in. Time flew like that, and like I'm I'm still totally in this. And like usually like that's a hard thing for me. Like I'm a big like visual, you know, I've got to I've got to see it to believe it kind of guy. But like man, the writing and the execution in this film is so on point. Like. There is like almost not a piece of dialogue or a gesture out of out of motion. And like but like what really hooks me into this movie beyond all those things, obviously, is like like you said, Ethan, the way in which this film is about like checking your prejudice. Um and like the the main thing for me is like the role it the way it discusses like the role of humanity and ethics in judicial and legislative practicing. So like I don't know. It's just like, and I feel like that's something that is rarely talked about, but it's almost essential to any kind of conversation about law. Like, you know, does humanity inform law or is it strictly by the numbers like that? Or is, and is there more at play beyond that? I think Um, there needs to, I think people need to see this movie now more than ever. Yeah. This is an important movie about like, you know, it's like the praxis between like what is, is law always a perfect exemplification of what is actually morally righteous? You know, it's it's a thought to think about, and I think that's something that's important. But yeah, great, great movie. Like, really top tier up there. And like, I've always felt like I would never want this movie to be remade. 
Mm. Like it, they, they would really have to like do something huge to make this remade. And the cast would, the cast would have to be perfect. Oh yeah. Like, yeah, you would need like to pull out all the stops if you want to even come close to matching it. But yeah, this is a great movie. It's so much about checking, like, especially today and everything that's going on. Like, it's about checking those innate thoughts that you have in your head, those those snap judgments, you know, that it do, it doesn't t- like it doesn't mean anything to, by your character. It's just like you have those thoughts because of the environment you've been raised in, you know. Yeah. So definitely. at the beginning of the film, they all but Henry Fonda vote guilty, right? Yeah. And that's just because they and we know there's good people in those jurors, you know. Mm-hmm. But because of, like, the environment that they've been raised in, they just say, okay, yeah, guilty. But this film's about taking a step back, you know, and addressing those thoughts and feelings that uh, our society has given towards you, you know? <laughs> so what I'm saying <laughs> is this movie is Joker. Um, no. It's in the same universe. <laughs> I strongly suggest watch after watching this movie, just go right into Todd Phillips' Joker. No. So that's that's the stacked recommendation. Is a double feature of those two films. Yeah. All right. Great first picks, everyone. Yeah. Great first picks. So let's loop this back into to me. And this is a film that I touched on a few episodes ago, but not in a stack. I just. I just brought it up in a film that I was watching of during the week. And um, it's a 1999 film. Uh, it is Brad Bird's first film, The Iron Giant. Double stack! You know, like, we, we've had double stacks three episodes in a row now. Bro. I thought about doing this. Bro, you thought about doing stack. triple stack? I, I thought about it. I, Is, I didn't was know that, that you... the other DVD that you had? Was no. Was that the light one? Oh, okay. No, but I All thought right. about it. I sincerely thought about it. Brandon had... He was debating over two films for his last one. A dark one and a light one. And we all told him to go with the dark I, one. No, I told him... Didn't I tell him light? You said well, light, but Joey and I said dark. Yeah, I, I asked you Joey mother. his opinion. So that... You motherfucker. You, you guys mother- screwed it up. <laughs> well, no, that's not the light one, right? Brandon? No, it's not. But I, I, I did not. consider it was in the final. Okay. When I was determining my stack or what would be a part of the list that I would determine my stack with, uh, it came down to four movies that I was deciding between. Uh, and right before that, I had eliminated The Iron Giant and another animated movie. Ooh, so. Okay. Well, let me get into The Iron Giant because th- actually, let me let me get into the story of Brad Bird. I find this really fascinating. So. He was one of the, the earliest graduating classes of Cal Arts, like the like defining school for animation in the industry. You know, I feel like that's always brought up when you when animation is discussed in animation and academia. He went to Disney after he graduated, and he worked on Fox and the Hound and Brandon's favorite, The Black Cauldron. <laughs> no, he <hates> that movie. <laughs> disagree. Um, I don't like that movie. And then he was a creative consultant on a bu- on a bunch of like uh, more mature animated shows like The Simpsons and King of the Hill and uh, The Critic. Isn't that weird? That like I don't know. I I didn't really see that coming from him. But yeah, he worked tight with Warner Brothers because of that, and uh, he pitched making this film. And when it came out, nobody saw it. This was a financial bomb. And but now it's gained such a fucking uh, cult. You know, like, it's become such a cult icon, and deservedly so, because this film is absolutely beautiful. Like I said a couple episodes ago, like, he is able to capture... Brad Bird is such a, like, a romantic director. Do you know what I'm saying? Hmm. Like, he's able to romanticize about a time, in a like, a time in our, uh, or a place like a time in America or a different place on the world, like with Ratatouille in Paris, you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like he, he really captures, like, the wonder of science fiction cinema in the 50s. Like, I don't... Th- like, this is better... It's better than any science fiction film that's ever come out in the 50s. But he's able to capture, like... No. I feel like the, the wonder... No? Any American <laughs> science fiction film. Sorry. No. Godzilla is better than this movie. No. no. You think the... Day of the Earth still is better. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like this film is actually based a lot on that. 
Yeah, I agree. But I think that's just a more philosophical one. This is a lot more fun than that. But that's because it's primarily aimed at children. And he's able to also, like, take, I feel like, an aesthetic that's been lost in Steven Spielberg in the in the recent years, like, ever since the 90s. But, like, it's like that unexplainable, like, wondrous feeling of the unknown that Spielberg has explored and, like, all the way up until Jurassic Park, I feel, you know, that I that I feel like he does explore through, like, the lighting and um, the background art. Like I said earlier, a few episodes ago, it's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the caricatures of the, the government and the, the young boy character. <laughs> yeah, you're Hogarth. Totally right. And it's just, oh. It's such a beautiful film and it makes me it makes me so emotional at the end like don't the Superman spoil. the Superman parallels yeah I don't want to but like oh it's great Chris have at it Oh man this is such a great movie We we talked briefly about this movie a couple episodes ago but I forgot what the context was but yeah I mean like pretty much everything you said resonates with me as well Um I guess like what I'll add to the conversation is like the, there's a line in this move in the movie and it's kind of like an ongoing motif I guess It's like this idea of like, you are who you choose to be, not what people think you are. So and I think that's a really great message, especially for young kids who are predominantly the people that are watching that film, Um, you know, like, like saying screw fate, screw destiny, you're, you are who you want to be, and you just have to chase it and be the best version of that person that you want to be. Yeah. And like, you know, and like, my like man like the setting of this movie like the 60s i think yeah the, like that's yeah, the 50s so... or 60s yeah something like that and like it was just like it's just so heartwarming and enduring the animation like still works today the the score is so beautiful but like just like the genuine friendship between a little kid and a giant hulking mass of metal is so tender and you wouldn't think that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like, it's really a movie about, like, not judging people based on what, not necessarily what they look like, but, like, what you, what your immediate interpretation of them is. And I think that's something a lot of people can learn from. A lot like 12 Angry Men. Wow. Look at this. Look at us. Yeah, we're going to make. Well, not me. So, so, so it's 12 Angry Men, Joker. No. Our, no. Yeah. No. Have after watching Joker, <laughs> watch Iron Giant. Just humble Iron. yourself a bit with Iron Giant. <laughs> ah, <laughs> right. my third favorite movie, uh, Iron, the Iron Giant. Giant. My f- right after Moonlight and Click. It's not about the money. It's about a giant robot and a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brandon. All right, Good Brandon. Way. Take us uh, to your next one. Or no, oh, talk about I don't want to talk about. I, I get <laughs> it. <laughs> oh well, if you want, if you got something to add, yeah. No, I was gonna, I was gonna add. The reason why I didn't pick uh, Iron Giant for this one is because I was gonna do it for another stack if we did it in the future. Ooh. I was gonna do it for uh, the best Cold War movie. Oh, shit. oh, that is a great Cold War movie because this is a movie that, like a lot of fifties monster movies and fifties uh, sci-fi movies, deals with nuclearization. And the dangers and the fear of created by the space race and uh, the arms race that happened during that time and how there's this little slice of the Americana. I mean, it's kind of a little myth, but at the same time, it's like uh, it really captures the United States in a mental state that's really unstable. Yeah, uh, it's very similar to a t- period of time that we're going through right now. Like there's no real I mean, Afghanistan's real and stuff like that, but because war is fought more with information than it's the fought with weapons. Um, I, I really get, you get really get the feel of tension. Uh, like Ethan brought up, the ending of this movie is magnificent. Probably one of the best movie endings ever. Yeah. Uh, and just like the emotion that comes out of it, the, the selflessness and kind of how it redeems uh, humanity in a sense for its misgivings. Mm-hmm. is something that I can really get behind and say is really beautiful. And it is very beautiful. Wow, look at look at that. What a wholesome discussion we just had. There. Yeah, that was so sweet. <laughs> All right, Brandon, take us to your depressing-ass movie. Yep, this was yeah. my number two. <laughs> you guys haven't seen this movie, but it's Peter Bogdanovich's Targets. I'm going to show you. Targets. Targets. 
Oh, okay, wait. So what book is that that you're holding up right now? It's my Bible. Movies <laughs> to see before you die. <laughs> Right, it's so. the holy fucking bible <laughs> it's the holy fucking bible dude <laughs> a thousand one movies to see before you die yeah okay and i've been meaning to check this movie out for a while and it was on the criterion channel and i finally got the chance to see it and this movie is fantastic uh it's one of the most prescient movies ever made because it predicted a state of mind that we're very much living in today and the way this movie like came about is freaking crazy guys um the director was working on another movie i think with um the guy who did hairspray the old hairspray john waters i'm pretty sure I th- i'm pretty sure it was john waters and uh he had two extra days with boris karloff and boris he was he was a friend with him so he was like hey if you want to work on this movie i've got you you can have him for two days for free and no extra charge and Boris Karloff is like a big star. So, of course, this is going to be a big jumpstart to his career. And essentially, this movie is about a guy who tries to convince Boris Karloff to make a movie. Uh, but at the same time, interjecting in this uh, escalation about a Vietnam War veteran who goes on a mass shooting tear. And it's wow. extremely dark, uh, extremely realistic to what we see today. And kind of explains us as like who we are as human beings and why we sometimes snap. And it's very fantastic. Yeah, you've been you've been preaching this film to us for a while now, and it's so unavailable. Like I can't find it anywhere. Okay, it was like, Roger Corman. Watch. Sorry, my bad. Roger Corman. Yeah, no, not John Waters. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, that Same. looks like this film's not getting on the final stack. Minus oh. one for you. No. Uh, <laughs> no, but. This movie sounds completely like so fascinating. It's like, it sounds like a, a less macho version of Rambo, closer to the books, the fir- the first blood book that was written. But I I haven't seen Boris Karloff in any other role besides like his monster roles, like uh, Frankenstein and the Mummy. Mm-hmm. So this is yeah, I'm I'm completely sold on this movie. I just need to find a way to watch it. Chris, what do you think? I literally have never heard of this movie before. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there's I, I'm on their letterbox right now I'm trying to see if there's anything I can like draw to like talk about but like I feel like Brandon covered pretty much everything like there is to talk about at least like in terms of like me being someone who's never seen the movie yeah it was a good sell um, thank you yeah I mean like it's like a gr- it's a really great pitch and um, I think like I don't know I, I really don't know what, what more to say beyond like I'm intrigued for sure um, I'm gonna put that on my watch list actually uh, it's it's really good. It's sobering for sure. It it puts it also puts kind of a lens on desensitization to violence and how because of whether it be mass media or people uh, going to war at a really young age and not really being able to comprehend the damage they're doing. Uh, both stories kind of crescendo in the same place, and it ends up making a really good de- message about movie watching and the the fans of movies and how sometimes that's not necessarily a good thing if they're too much of a fan like a super fan so it's like the fanatic um (laughs) not directly no i wouldn't say so but you are saying it's like joker like Mm. this sounds like a good thing to watch after joker (laughs) it kind of is to be honest all right, I w- I we got our final stack. That. It's uh, 12 Angry Men, Joker, and Targets. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, <laughs> should we make that a... Uh, should we tweet that? Just out of context. <laughs> those, those three posters don't say anything else. <laughs> yeah, maybe after the show. A little, pre- little preview of next week. And then they'll throw, you <laughs> throw everybody off. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, yeah, good pick. Good pick. You. All right, let's get into this final round. So my last film is a comedy from 2004 it's adam mckay's first film i already talked about talladega nights but this is his first will ferrell feature which is anchorman the legend of ron burgundy now uh, a little bit about adam mckay uh he was a writer from snl uh from 1995 to 2001 and he contributed to a lot of famous will ferrell sketches and also had a hand in creating like the snl digital short that is 
sort of become iconic in the show now because that's really their first transition into like digital sketch comedy. Um, but yeah, after his run SNL, he used Will Ferrell sort of as like his muse in his next batch of films, and that all started with here, Anchorman. Now this film is, it I think it's my favorite. Com- no, it's not my favorite comedy. It's one of my favorite comedies of all time. Uh, just M- McKay does such a good. He builds such a good cast of characters. This is such a well casted movie. Like with the whole news team. Like it's. Probably my favorite Steve Carell role. Like, Paul Rudd is Brian Fantana. We got Champ. And uh, it's it's become such an iconic comedy with the Battle of the News teams and Sex Panther and just all that good stuff. Uh, Will Ferrell's Ron Burgundy never ceases to make me uh, laugh, you know? And I could watch this movie anytime, anywhere. You tell me the place, I'll be there. Anchorman. All right, Brandon, you have a Ron Burgundy mustache right now. We must address that. Uh, how do you feel? How do you, how do you feel about this movie? Uh, this is another movie where, when I first watched it, I did not like it, but oh. when I rewatched it, it noticeably improved. Right. Uh, I love the the humor and interplay between each of the Anchorman. I always thought Steve Carell was funniest in this movie. Yeah. And I still think so. Him as Brick is just, he's as dumb <laughs> as a brick and is amazing. But it's like not like the dumb humor that like is in Dumber and Dumber. It's like actually like backed by some intelligence and satire. So another reason why I like it is that it satires news media. And that's something that I'm really interested in being a part of maybe. Mm-hmm. So it, that was excellent. And it's also a good period piece. Like, you don't see many 70-set comedies that are, like, really that good, and it really does a good job at capturing that That's time. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Chris, what do you think? Have you seen this film? Yeah, I have. I just realized I haven't even ranked it on my thing. I'll do that right after the podcast. But, <laughs> yeah, the, like, my God. I remember, like, being so enamored by Will Ferrell in this role. Like, his, like, what, like, red, like, tuxedo is, like... And his mustache and his hair is just so iconic. I've, I don't think I've ever like been so, like enchanted, if you will, <laughs> by Will Ferrell as I am when I watched this movie. Like and yeah, like you said, Ethan, like the rest of the cast, it's it really does like echo this kind of like, not even like it's kind of like sketch comedy kind of vibe, but there's something more to it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's all just very like. I don't know. It's I I want to say sitcom, but in the best way possible. Like right. a lot of like dialogue and just like interplay between these characters that drives the entire film for me. It it is kind of kind of sitcommy. Like it's kind of like it kind of does parody all sorts of media in the seventies. You know, like I know sitcoms were really big back then, and like. It they probably made the the biggest evolution in the seventies, you know, because from our history of TV class we learned. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I can totally see those comparisons that you're saying. Yeah, good insight, good insight. All right, that's my last film. Chris, take us into your last film. All right, my last film. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised that no one picked this one. Um, it is a film bro slash film school darling. <laughs> Um, it is a film that came out the year that we all went to college, 2017. Jordan Peele's Get Out. Oh. Huh? Huh? Oh, Not shit. bad. Too yeah, basic. Yeah. You gave sorry. it, didn't you give it? No, no, it no. The movie's, the movie's fantastic. I just think the idea the of big like, mm. Well, there, there's like, another, there's another 2020s, 2010s first time director. Horror. Yeah, wow. horror, horror is huge in the Damn. Yeah, but that. um, okay. Let's just co- I'll just quickly like try and dive into the story and themes, with, like without giving away too much. Hot where it Basically, yeah. the film was about this uh, played by Daniel Kalu- Kaluuya. There's this character named Chris. He has this girlfriend named Rose. Chris is a black man. Rose is a white woman, and he goes with her upstate to go meet her family for the first time. And you know, immediately you think, oh, like funny comedy you're probably gonna have some like really good like 
race based like humor. You're gonna have like some good like discussion about like race relations here. Like it's and you have coming to dinner from 1967. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But wait a minute. <laughs> Here's a twist. a twist. Oh, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, like this movie. I'm trying. I'm really trying not to get like get into what it's about, what it's like more closely about. But like the commentary on like the subtleties of racism in the contemporary era, and like how racism has like shifted to this to this like more nuanced kind of like um, form. Not to say that like um, that's not to say that more overt versions of racism don't exist but it's it's an exemplification of how racism is intersectional and how you can it adapts and moves and it changes throughout time and space um and yeah my my god this film like touched so many chords with like you know the discussion on race especially in america um and it might man it's just so engaging like I think Daniel Kaluuya might give the best performance of his career in this film, and he he's a great actor. Um, but yeah, like man, this movie's rich with like a disc- like it's a. I would say like if you had to show someone like quintessential films on like discussing race relations in contemporary America, this is this has to be there. But yeah, what do you guys think? I think this movie is an instant classic. Mm. From the yeah. moment. It came out, it touched, a, it hit a vein of what America was going through after Trump's re or election. Uh, let's not hope for the re-election. Uh, <laughs> Please! But it really hit the, it really hit the vein of uh, what, what it means to be racist in America because it's, it's capturing a different form of it. This isn't the hillbilly form of racism that's painted mostly in like films like deliverance or something more like texas chainsaw is kind of it kind of deals with racism in that way it it deals with it from the upper class white perspective like you can be racist through and i I hate saying this as a white person or because it's like you know it's it's kind of hypocritical for me to be talking about it but it's to point out the fact that you can be racist while like enhancing your own self-esteem about how you treat a certain person or a certain community right like if you even if you would have voted for obama for a third term you can still be racist you know if you it's it's how you treat people and it's how you um form your stereotypes and opinions about them in society uh it's all like yeah sorry sorry um it's just like like you said like about how it changed like it's very like almost like performative now Mm mm-hmm and like, like black, you know, like, it even speaks to today. Like if you look at, yeah, I'm not totally. Gonna, I'm not going to say this applies to certain people that follow me online, but like people will post something, one thing like that black square on black lives matter during that mm-hmm. blackout thing on, but they won't post yeah. anything outside of that. And it's mm-hmm. almost like it's becoming a trend. Whereas yeah. like, it's not about that. The, yeah. It's not about that. It's about a bigger message. And the, yeah, the way a, this movie plays with tone and stuff also is. Hmm. Yeah. And like you said, like the, the black square thing, like the whole, like it could even function as a commentary on like the aestheticization of foreign culture, you know? And like, if you, if you know what this movie, what happens in this movie, it's very obvious. Oh, I like, completely agree. Taking something that's not yours and like adapting it to become your own for okay. your own, like materialistic, superficial bullshit Mm -hmm. but yeah like okay yeah that's so it's so great like the the visual symbolism that jordan peele is able to capture in this film is amazing like it's almost kubrickian like i mean he's 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 stated that like the shining is one of his biggest inspirations in films and God damn it. Stop it. It's You're Brandon fucking... showed his nipple on Brandon the Brandon keeps showing me his nipples. I'm trying <laughs> to be serious here, you fucking dork. It's hot. <laughs> it's hot in Arizona. It's hot. Oh. <laughs> like 116. No, but like this also goes back to those like the innate like prejudices that we were talking about in 12 Angry Men. Look at all this like connections that we're making in these films that we've chosen. It's amazing. And yeah, you you two perfectly like talked about 
how this film is amazing like in a cultural subtext and like well done this is a great pick yeah all right brandon hmm. finish it oh finish us off <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh i could i could switch at the last moment to the lighter do, it, pick. do whatever you want man no nah, i'm gonna go with the darker pick all right okay uh mine is a 2010 lesser known movie i think that i think only ethan has seen what it's uh oh, by duncan jones oh and it's called moon moon with sam rockwell yeah this movie Great. is about a uh, astronaut who's on i think it's I think it's the moon. No, it's on the moon. Of course it's on the moon. I was going to say Mars. <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah, on, he was actually um, on Mars. <laughs> oh, shit. Where is he on? Fuck. Oh, shit. I forgot. No. I, okay, I know he's in space. Um, but what planet? What what planet is he on? Um, All right, I'm changing my pick. Okay, this is... this is. No, keep it. No, no, no. You're committed. You said it already. All right. He's on, he's on the moon, and he's on a mining expedition, and he's in his last few weeks. And, you know, it's kind of playing with that castaway sentiment of being alone and only your only person, not even person, the only thing that's accompanying you is a robot. Uh, and one day he gets in an accident, in a rover accident, so he doesn't go home. But instead, he, he think, you think he dies, but actually he comes back and he walks back to the space station and finds out that there's a clone there of him. Yeah. And you got to kind of deal with that existential thing of which is the real person? Why is he on the station? And all of that. And it's amazing. It's quite. It's like a, it's, yeah, go ahead. That reminds me of. Okay, I haven't seen this movie. You know, what else is new? But <laughs> um, man, that, that pitch. Wow. That's like. That sounds a little bit like Oblivion, but better. Oh, it's far better than Oblivion. <laughs> it's so much better than Oblivion. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, you're right. It's such a philosophical film, you know, about dealing with like uh, who is your true self. Mm -hmm. If you can just be so like easily cloned like that. Like he always thought he was the, just the original, you know, but now he did. He uncovers this mass like uh, plot about his entire his lives it's kind of groundhog day except for it doesn't deal with time it deals with just replicating a person it's also not you know? funny so it's, it's i mean <laughs> it's 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 kind of funny it, sam rockwell has a good personality in this movie and there's like good interactions between he, he himself yeah, and kevin spacey oh yeah kevin spacey's in this movie we don't want to talk about that but he's just <laughs> he voices the robot so whatever yeah. but yeah this is Man, you picked another like condensed location film. Like it's all, it takes place all in this moon base, and it's it's a fantastic film. What a picture! What a picture! All right, there we go. That's that. Those are our films. Wow. Hmm. Interesting picks. Interesting picks. All right, let's run them down. Let's run them down. So, my debut. Uh, directorial debut stack is clerks the iron giant and anchorman chris my directorial debuts are uh jennifer kent's the babadook same as ethan brad bird's the iron giant and finally jordan peele's get out brandon uh mine are karen kusama's uh girl girl fight uh no i'm joking what? i was gonna i was just gonna go off and like, <laughs> you just us, like, uh, i was like us. did we talk about that did i zoom out that hard yeah, like, well, yeah, well. uh okay my three are uh sydney lumet's uh 12 angry men peter bogdanovich's targets and duncan jones's moon before we get into it brandon i'm so um so i did guess 12 angry men the other two films I thought you were going to pick, but I was surprised you didn't, were Reservoir Dogs and Blood Simple. I thought about Blood Simple, Ooh. but Reservoir Dogs, I was like, it's not my favorite Tarantino. No, I, also, yeah. I also thought you were going to pick Duel. I thought Spielberg's about Duel. Duel. I thought about Duel too, as, too. That was on the list. What, what was your light film? Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Oh. Oh, really? Is that Terry Gilliam's? 
Wait, did he direct that? Yeah, yeah the first movie. First. Oh, man. That's great. So I had okay. a good four, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So... Iron Giant, obviously, is going to be on this. Yeah. Got a double we'll stack here. And okay. we I, I have a proposal. Okay, go for it. So I think, like Ethan said, I think Iron Giant's essential. I also think 12 Angry Men is absolutely essential. Basically, now we're in a discussion over what the third film is. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put my foot in and say get out, but Brand did say it is kind of like a too obvious of a pick, God. which I get. Um, wow. But at the same time, it's kind of like a really, like, you know, I think it's almost like so perfectly fitting for this. But I don't, I don't, do you guys have a counter argument to that? So we had uh, 12 Angry Men and Iron Giant. Those, mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like those are two definitely right. going to be on the stack. Uh, I would go for either one of Chris's other films, if I'm going to be completely honest. No? Brennan's shaking his head. I wouldn't Brandon, choose. What, what do you want? What, you what, what are you, what's Duke? floating around in your head? I don't have much. <laughs> don't have much yeah. he well, doesn't you, care you right. your other films were moon and uh targets. what was the other one the gun one. Oh, right targets targets um, i mm. i can't really say because i haven't seen targets we got to do something I, um, contemporary i think though well i think get out. let's keep let's keep this thematic like string that we have going on here i think we should do get out like they each cover social things going on in our society just in different times like nuclearization and race and uh how we treat justice as a concept so maybe we should go get out let's go get out okay that's easy that was the easiest stack ever yeah we've never we haven't ever debated like this was yeah that was the easiest stack we ever had to put together okay but now wait we got to figure out the order here what's the order here no no all right just watch them all at the same time just do whatever you want guys it's like (laughs) doesn't matter anymore I, I, just, um, just stop I would show. say i think oh fuck me um i think we should just do chronological order chronological like or, in terms of like when they were made well i mean if we honestly let's 12 angry men's a good starting point i think right yeah. or mm. do you want to end with 12 angry men i don't know because like when i went finished 12 angry men i want to rewatch that movie Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if we go next, which is Iron Giant, you have an argument that it's next chronologically in time because it takes place in like the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. Uh, and then you also have that argument because it's the 90s. It's a 90s animated film. Right. Uh, so that it, and it's kind of an evolution of the issue. And then you got something more modern like Get Out, which covers something more topical for today. Okay. I'm cool with that. What do you think? I think that sounds good. Yeah, I All like right. that. Well then, Cracks Knuckles, let's run it down. Brandon, do you want to start us off with our quintessential directorial debut film stack? Let's hit it. Our first film is Sidney Lumet's 12 Angry Men, the, the, a film about justice, a film about finding out the truth, and a film about being a human being. And our second film is Brad Bird's The Iron Giant. Uh... An iconic first feature for the animation director that depicts a beautiful relationship between a boy and a giant robot and uh, what it means to uh, create your own image in a society that uh, has a lot of prejudices and confronting those, those pressures in a really heartwarming tale. And that's The Iron Giant. And our final film is a 2016 film by Jordan Peele. It's Get Out. It uh, was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor, Best Picture, Best Director, and it won Best Original Screenplay. Um, It is a film that deals with race relations in the contemporary era um, and how the evolution and the evolution of that and also the aestheticization of foreign cultures for one's own superficial and materialistic benefit. A very important film for um, the modern discussion within America. And there you have it. That's the stack. And that's the stack. And that's stacked. That's the show, everyone. Um, Thank you all for listening. Uh, Be sure to, if you you enjoyed our discussions and our thoughts on these films, be sure to give our, uh, our 
a like on the video and subscribe to our channel for more more thingies. If you're listening on other platforms, please support us. Uh, continue to support us on, through those ones. We are now on Google Podcasts. That's just a new development that I forgot to announce. So we are we we are ever expanding. Now I just got to figure out a, a better way to get us onto Apple Podcasts, but I'll, I'll figure that out. But yeah, that's that's it. That's all from us from here in Orange, California, and Mesa, Arizona. This is Stack Podcast signing off. <laughs> 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 <laughs>